Hello everyone, welcome back to Our Table is Ready. We are here with William Starrett, the Executive Director of the South Carolina Ballet. William, thank you so much for being a it's guest. It's so great to see you, John, thank you. Always good to see you. I, when I, let's see, I, I lived in Columbia for a while and managed a restaurant and I, I knew you then. And then once I started going to 12-step meetings, I would see you at those. And then I moved away to Charleston and New York and then came back for what I thought was a visit, it ended up for me that I was gonna live here. And I remember, you know, giving up the New York dream and, and it was a difficult thing for me to do. And I remember seeing you one time and you told me, I was, you know, I was talking about, I, I just hate to leave New York and all that. And you said, John, it's much easier to be a big fish in a small pond right. than a big fish in a big pond. and. That really helped me then. You know, okay. I was like, oh, yeah. okay. And I thought, well, if William can, <laughs> if William can live here, so can I. Because, um, you know, to, looking at you, you, it looks like that you would want to live in Milan or London or Paris or anywhere yes. but Columbia. Yeah. But uh, yeah. here you are, and, and here I am. And, and I'm so glad I stayed because I ended up opening up a business and, yeah. and becoming a incredibly successful restaurant. Thank you. And uh, just what a great community it is. It is, and it took me, it took me really, thirty five years to embrace Columbia and, and really want to call it my home. It mm -hmm. was a real transition because I was living right in Manhattan. But I moved, it was a really difficult time in the mid 80s and so many of my friends had died from AIDS. Mm -hmm. And um, my teacher that I loved lost his school and he was moving to another location. And I had been traveling for three years and hadn't lived anywhere and just out of a suitcase. And I was offered the position here and I could be based here for 21 weeks at least. And so, you know, New York's so high energy and but it can be exhausting. Mm -hmm. And so the beauty of Columbia really appealed to me in the seasons, and I could see a lot of potential here. Mm -hmm. So that helped me, but it took a long time. And in my first contracts, it was in my contracts that they paid for me to go back to New York four times a year. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. That changed after a while, but um, it was really a culture shock. Now, where are you from? I'm originally from California from Southern California, Palm Springs. So it's a big difference. And I, I moved from Palm Springs to San Francisco. And I did my formal training in San Francisco. And then I lived in Canada. I was with the Royal Winnipeg Ballet. And then I moved to New York. And I was with the American Ballet Theater and the Joffrey Ballet. Now, so growing up in Southern California, how was, did you have a good childhood? What was your childhood It was like? a horrible childhood. Really? <laughs> I was a child of an alcoholic. Oh, there you go. So <clears throat> my mother was a terrible alcoholic. and. Um, inconsistent behavior mm -hmm. and so a lot of wanting to dance was getting away from my from my family from my home life and of course wanting to dance you know being teased in school mm -hmm. and that so I went to the um, Nova Academy in the San Francisco Conservatory of Dance so PE and my education was ballet was dance mm -hmm. and so I was surrounded by other dancers and other artists and in a bigger city, I felt a lot more comfortable. So I left home at 12, and I left my parents wow. and my dog and my sister and lived on my own, but I wanted to really escape the drama and trauma of my, of my mother uh -huh. Uh -huh. and also being so teased at school. What was the, the teasing? What was that? Were they bullying Oh, because you? I was gay, or they thought I was gay, or because I danced, or yeah. all like that. What was, what was that like? I was best friends with the head of the football team and the head of the baseball team. So they kind of protected me. Uh -huh. And I was popular. I was a student body president in junior high in 7th oh, cool. and 8th grade. But um, still they would tease me because I wasn't good at sports. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I liked hanging with the girls. And, <laughs> you know, I wanted to be on the, I was on the dance decorating committee on the big dance, social dance that was coming up. And I was in the plays and, and uh -huh. they knew I danced and things like that. I just had other interests. Right. So um, I wasn't the normal kind of guy around school. Yeah. What, uh, what got you interested in dance? Was it a way, like, how did you well, all of a sudden like dance? Uh, so I loved Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly and that on TV. And then 
my dad had a construction company and he was remodeling this big Spanish hacienda in Southern California and they ended up having trouble paying the bill and the wife had a dancing school and so the wife her name was Carmen Cookson and she said you know they said can we trade and give your kids some dance lessons to help pay the bill really and so my folks asked me did we want to take dancing and my sister and I took dance and I loved it and we became like a little team we danced at PTA meetings and pool parties and and then my teacher moved away. Her husband was um, the art director for the Carol Burnett Show in L.A. So they moved from Palm Springs to L.A. So then I didn't dance from like 8, 9, 10, 11. Oh. And so, you know, when something's taken away from you as a child, you want it even more. Yeah. So that gave me even a bigger drive to want to dance, and I missed it. And so when you left home at age 12, was it to go to a dance? Yes. Okay. So I had full scholarship in, in San Francisco, and I joined the San Francisco Conservatory, and they, I had the dance training and uh, also the academic training. What was your um, first professional job? I, my, professional, my first professional job was with the Royal Winnipeg Ballet, and I um, got a scholarship from San Francisco to be in their school in San Francisco, I mean in Royal Winnipeg. And then I was in the school for a year, and then I was hired right out of the school as a soloist. I was like 16, 17, and I was already touring to South America. I was dancing in Rio and Buenos Aires. And we had a, my first year's contract with them was 54 weeks. And I toured. At 16? Mm -hmm. 60, wow. And 17, yeah. That's Rio, awesome. and we went to Israel and Hong Kong and all over the world. That's awesome. What's the largest a crowd you've ever performed for? The largest crowd I ever performed for was 40,000 people in. Osaka, Japan. Yeah. What's that like? What, what's the? Well, it was amazing. Um, it was on a Supertron, so the people could uh -huh. see it, uh -huh. and so it was hard not to watch yourself <laughs> yeah. dancing because there was these huge films of you everywhere, you know. And then uh -huh. they close up, and yeah. you're trying to focus you because you're thinking they're not closing up on the right time or the right place, you know. Yeah. So you can't be a film director. You're supposed <laughs> to be dancing, you know. Yeah. So that was a little distracting, you know. You're very young in your 20s when this is happening, so you don't even realize the full impact, uh -huh. I think. Yeah. Like, when I think about it, I've danced like at Carnegie Hall and the opera houses in Berlin and San Francisco Opera House. I've danced at the Met. I've danced, you know, in the greatest theaters in the world. And you kind of don't realize at the moment how yeah. extraordinary that is until later. Yeah, in that world, it's, it's hindsight is everything. Yeah, and you don't, you know, you're so at least for myself, speaking for myself, I'm so tied up with the art and performing mm -hmm. well and uh, that you kind of aren't thinking about that. Were you hard on yourself? Terribly. Yeah. You know, one thing I really regret is not dancing sober, you know? Uh -huh. And I was very self-involved and very selfish. I was insanely driven. Mm -hmm. Insanely well, yeah. driven. It, um, especially from such a young age and everything. Yeah. Um, did you ever perform not sober? Like, no. Yeah. No. Yeah. That, that was would be rule. really difficult. That was the rule that I always performed sober and I never missed class. Uh -huh. So I was very functioning. Uh -huh. But I do remember performing in Rio and being out all night at the clubs and dancing in, you know, in the clubs at Ipanema and Copacabana. And I remember coming back the next day. I never went to the hotel. I went back to the theater for the matinee and showered at the theater <laughs> and oh, went on again. So that probably was not yeah. a good decision. Yeah. But you probably weren't exactly sober for that. But well, don't tell my dancers today. I would never allow right. that. Right? Yeah, no, yeah no. exactly. Yeah, it's it's funny what we would allow now and what we didn't then. But um, yeah, or vice versa. What about now? Dateline did a story on you yes. in '99, <clears throat> I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah about my you hip had a double hip replacement. Yeah. So what was that about? <clears throat> so I wore out all my cartilage in both hips. And so I was unusually flexible as a dancer. I was kind of one of the first dancers that the old Russian style of teaching, they thought that if the male dancers stretched too much, they wouldn't have the jump and that it would ground them. But I was like, I don't buy that because they're girls that are crazy flexible and they can jump just as high if not higher than the guys. Uh -huh. And I was smaller in stature and I wanted to not dance Mercutio, I wanted to be Romeo. So I 
lengthen my muscles and I had unusually flexible feet, good insteps. And so I wanted to be taken seriously as a full classical premier dancer and not just mm -hmm. the character dancer. Mm -hmm. And so I needed to have the line that was very classical. And so, you know, some of the shorter character dancers have big thighs and they do all the tricks and things. And so I could do all of that. Mm -hmm. I was very physically gifted, but I wanted to also be taken seriously and do the romantic princely roles. Uh -huh. And so I was one of the first dancers who were, could do all the lines and were very flexible in the air and jump very high. So I kind of made my own way that I was very unusual. And I won the highest American medal in the first international ballet competition that was held in the United States. Really? And so then I was invited to tour to 29 countries after that. Having doing that, I had three managers, and I, I toured, again, for three years and didn't live anywhere. And uh, I think they, I overproduced my flexibility. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. And so I wore out the car cartilage on my hips. And so that, the first signs of that is you lose flexibility, which was mm -hmm. my whole thing. Eventually, I had to retire, and I, I danced bone on bone for another two years. Really? And I stayed immersed in water and would rehearse because then there was a little bit of buoyancy. Uh -huh. And then I would just perform on the stage. I wouldn't rehearse on the ground. Uh -huh. And I could survive. I performed like that for two more years. And then I had to retire. And I had gone completely bone on bone. And uh -huh. then the doctor said that I was more flexible than any normal, regular human being, and there was nothing he could do, and I would be fine. So five years later, I couldn't walk anymore. I was on a cane. It was horribly painful. Dr. Chillock here in Columbia knew, he had just come to a big convention, and this um, uh, doctor out of, new, uh, out of LA was designing this new um, hip replacement resurfacing. And so I, he said he thought I was a great candidate for that. So I went to mm -hmm. LA, and I was, and then he had a big publicist, and I was the youngest person to ever have the new hip replacement, and he had a big team, and I had two, two hips done at once. What was unusual about it, they had done hip replacements in the 50s, but parts of the, the metal would go into your bloodstream. So they worked with the science department, and it's the same cobalt steel that's on the tips of rocket ships. Really? And I'm the first one that has, I think, number 32 and 33 or something like that. Really? <clears throat> so they went and they wouldn't promise that they would do both hips at once and they just would see how it would work. They stopped at lunchtime and I, they said I have one leg at one side of the room and one leg on the other side of the room. And they decided to do both hips at once. It's really making my feet sweat. I know. The yeah. surgery was in June and I went back to the stage in February. So I danced again. So you danced after the double hip replacement? Yes. So I went back wow. to the stage. It was never quite the same. You know, okay. I was five years older, uh -huh. and I hadn't danced in five years. And to do the hip replacement, they sever the tendons in the front of your hips, which have to do with the inner and outer rotation of your leg. Uh -huh. And ballet, of course, is based on the outer rotation of your leg. Yeah. And one leg was better than the other. But I did dance again, and I went back to the stage, and I was already the executive director and the artistic director. And so it was a lot to also be the principal dancer, too. Uh -huh. So, And I would go in at like 5 a.m. and put myself through the paces and, and be ready for the day. Mm -hmm. um, and every time I performed, we would sell out. Mm -hmm. So I danced with it another four years, and then it was just time to retire again. Now, when did substances come into play? I remember in Canada dancing, and that the drinking age was 17. And so, you know, I was 16 and 17 in Canada. There was a big kind of drinking culture there. I know I drank a lot with the wardrobe, the head of the wardrobe department, and I didn't really know that I was falling into that. You know, I was really mm -hmm. young and touring a lot. And I remember waking up in Victoria, Canada, and I thought I had died <laughs> because I couldn't see and I couldn't move, and I was hearing bells. And it turned out I was in this bed and the sheets were really tight, and I, there were all these churches around and all these bells. <laughs> so I woke up and I said to myself, well, I can't drink Ryan 7 anymore. Uh, you know, yeah, I true. didn't realize that maybe I should 
look at how I was drinking. Right. No. It was just the right, right. stuff. It's that. The other thing was I would not drink if it was a big season. So I would say, well, I'm not going to drink until after the New York season. I'm mm -hmm. not going to drink until after the competition. I'm not going to drink until after my birthday. Or I'm not going to drink until after the spring season. Uh -huh. So I, I would kind of stop myself from drinking two or three months at a time. Uh -huh. But again, I didn't say to myself, well, William, the fact that you have to monitor your drinking, yeah. Yeah. maybe there's a problem. Right. I think people make that mistake of if I can quit for 30 days or if I can quit for a certain amount of time, then I don't have a problem. I, I did that. If I, you know, I'd never been fired, so I didn't have a problem. I didn't drink at work, so I didn't have a problem. I wasn't living under a bridge, so yeah. I didn't have a problem. Yeah. You didn't realize that. And the other thing I learned in the program was, you know, how it's hereditary. Uh -huh. And so many, you know, I was so um, tortured with my mother's drinking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in my mind, I said, oh, I never want to be like that. And, I never, yeah. and then I was and didn't even realize it. Uh -huh. Didn't even know. It's, it's that denial. So many people that... I've met um, in recovery and, and hear from, you know, their their parent was how could they do it and how they wouldn't do that and and yet and here I we was. are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what what made you get sober? Well, um, it was kind of a combination of things. Uh -huh. So one was I was dating this guy or I wanted to date this guy, who was in recovery. There we so, go. so I thought, well, if I act like I'm in recovery, <laughs> then we'll have that in common. He can save you. Also, this guy wasn't completely out of the closet. Uh -huh. So we would go away together. and So romantic. It was, actually. <laughs> yeah. And we wouldn't, we'd be sober together. We'd have these great kind of hidden secret weekends uh -huh. or weeks. Uh -huh. And But then when I wasn't around him, I would drink. You know, so I was lying. Uh -huh. And then kind of I discovered that um, I kind of liked not drinking. And mm -hmm. so it kind of helped me. And then the other thing that helped me were two DUIs. Oh, yeah. Those are big helps. That was a really good um, yeah. leg up yeah. on that. Yeah, I think that that with my fear of people finding out that I could lose my job. Right. And then... My key partner in the dancing school, who I performed with for 17 years, just at one evening, she said just the right thing kind of to me. She said, I'm a little bit worried about you. And I think we need to, something like that, I'm just worried about you and I'm worried about how much you're drinking. And I'd gone through a breakup. Um, so those three things at once really took a lot. Uh -huh. But the three three things happening, and with the DUIs, I had to go to meetings, 12-step programs, and have them sign my paper. The first time was seven, the second time they had to sign it 13 times. Uh -huh. And I think that helped uh -huh. that I was going to meetings, I had to go to meetings, and it slowly creeped in, and I got a sponsor, and he was a good help. And not being so self-involved, uh -huh. I think... Not drinking is a small, teeny, tiny component of... I think that was a, my biggest demise. I was so self-involved and so selfish. And I'd have opening night in San Francisco, and I'd just be so mad because I didn't have opening night in Houston. And why can't they say, and I should have Houston, you know? <laughs> and so that just turns off the director. It's like there's no satisfying me. Yeah. You know, and I would have gotten so many, so much better parts and been so... If I had been happy with the gentleman who got Houston and... Congratulations, you did great, and I love watching you, and I learned so much from seeing you, and yeah. you know, if I had been supportive and kind to my coworkers, but no, I was just totally wanted more. Right, and it was never enough. And I, we can't live in the present when we're um, self-medicating like that. And I was never happy with my performance. I was, it was never enough. I was never satisfied. I should have done this, and I didn't do that. And, my partner wasn't good enough, and she didn't do this, and, mm. you know, and, and, you know, audience would come to me, and that was, oh, it's crap. You don't know what you're talking about. Get out of my yeah. dressing room. You know, it's horrible things. Yeah. You know, instead of being gracious and saying, thank you so much for being here, and uh -huh. I so appreciate you supporting the art, and um, I'm so glad you could come, and, yeah. you know, people don't want to hear your own criticism. They want to celebrate the experience they got to witness mm -hmm. and so I just as a director 
I am so grateful that I understand all of that now. And yeah. I'm mentoring and trying to have that to the company members. And then it's so important to me that my company dancers are kind to one another and supportive of one another and gracious to one another. Mm -hmm. And I regret that I didn't get to dance sober. Uh -huh. But I... I'm blessed that I get to pass that on and, um, right. and nurture new young people. It, it gets to help some new other people. What's something that you thought, at, maybe at the time, that was just such a, a big failure that you look back and it turned out to be a, a huge life lesson? You know, I think it all, it's all for a purpose and that's how you get here at this point. You know, there were some relationships I ended that were wonderful and mm -hmm. some you know, I, I remember I was offered a contract in Boston Ballet and the principal dancer wanted me so badly and he was retiring and he was a choreographer and he brought me to Boston and introduced me to the director and he graciously had me stay at his home and he wanted me to be the new principal dancer and I went there and I auditioned and then the director said, well, we don't really have a principal contract for you, but we want you to star and be opening in, in, as Albrecht and Giselle. And that's a principal role. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, that's wonderful, but that's a principal contract. And she only had a soloist contract. And I said, well, when you have a principal contract, call me. <laughs> you know, and I didn't understand uh -huh. as a director that, you know, Politically, get your foot in the door. I'm giving the new yeah. guy the brand new top thing. Right. And also, there was a budget already made, uh -huh. and the principal contract wasn't available this season. Yeah. You could get it next season. I was a principal dancer with other companies, and it was all good, but you know, so I don't know that I regret it, but that's right. an interesting thing that could have happened. It's a huge life lesson. Yeah. But, yeah. That <clears throat> being sober, I understand so much more now. Exactly. What is it like for you to live here? Because, I mean, you outdress everyone in town every day. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. And uh, something that I, I really admire about you is that you are here. I mean, this, you know, as a child, you were bullied for being gay or they thought you were gay then. And now, you know, and it's not that you dress gay, <laughs> but there's no question. <laughs> <laughs> and you you don't mind it, and you, you wear it very well. Thank you. I just think of dance and ballet and the art as I've always felt it, it should be very glamorous. Mm -hmm. And that ballet dancers, you know, King Louis the Fourteenth invented ballet. He thought he was chosen by God. Mm -hmm. And that he, um, he wanted his royal court to be like angels on earth. And so he trained and he started the art of ballet being trained professionally and he just had this ethereal feeling of that you were special. And then Diaghilev with Nijinsky, he, when the trains would come into town, he wanted this feeling of glamour mm -hmm. and he paid for what they wore when they came off the trains. And if the lobby and the theater wasn't grand enough, he would redecorate it. And he wanted this illusion of, of excitement and glam glamour and grandeur. You know, if you don't get dressed for the ballet, you know, people don't even get dressed for church. Yeah. They yeah. wear flip-flops and... <laughs> so yeah. I just believe that it's important if you don't get dressed for the opening night of Romeo and Juliet with the full South Carolina Philharmonic, when are you going to get dressed? Yeah. <laughs> At the Coger Center. Exactly. So yeah. I keep my New York standard here in Columbia. Good. And I think that that's why the company is successful. Uh -huh. And, you know, I'm not going to lower the standard. Yeah, that's, I think that's great. I, I think that um, you represent it and you're not embarrassed to do it. And, and um, it's just, it's great. It's, it's great just, to watch. It's just been me. You know, they, yeah. Ann Brody, our founding director, said, don't bring those big deal high flute New York City ideas here to the South and think they're going to work. And she was absolutely right. Uh -huh. You know, and I've learned how you do business here in the South, and I love it. I love uh -huh. it. And one of the reasons I wanted to come here because it was classy and glamorous, the ballet company here, and I uh -huh. saw the potential. But I do know, like, when I'm marketing to Charleston, you know, we toured all these cities. The way you market to Charleston is very different than the way you market to Savannah and the way you market to Myrtle Beach <laughs> and the way you market to Sumter uh -huh. and certainly the way you market to Columbia. But I know 
um, you can't just talk about business. You have to house the family. Uh -huh. And, you know, I heard your aunt was sick and how, you uh -huh. know, you build relationships. And uh -huh. I love that. Yeah. That's the okay. part about South Carolina that I love. And uh -huh. that then you get around to business and um, you can get a lot done. But I love in Columbia, you know, I, I know the mayor, I know the governor, and I uh -huh. can make a difference. And <laughs> what, are you, uh, what are you most proud of? I don't know. I'm proud of a lot of things. I'm proud that we're the largest performing arts organization in South Carolina. I'm proud of our educational outreach program. I started in 1991. We reached like three quarters of a million children every year. Well, not every year. We, we reach about 15,000 a year. Mm -hmm. I'm really proud of that. And we've made a particular arts program that's curriculum driven and has a teacher's guide. A lot of dance companies just give the dress rehearsal, which is pretty smart. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you're doing a Motown ballet, they bring the children to see the Motown Ballet, and that pays for the dress rehearsal of the evening show. But that isn't particularly educational. Right. So I really research the trends and what the teachers are dealing with. And so I created one, an example would be Bach, Beethoven, and Beyonce, um, Goldilocks and the Three Bs, Bach, Beethoven, and Beyonce. Oh, great. And oh, so they awesome. came and they learned about Bach and Beethoven. But they came, of course, because of Beyonce. Yeah, they knew Beyonce, yeah. Right. But the lesson was is that it takes all the support team to make Beyonce look like Beyonce. So mm -hmm. you have to have a marketing department, a finance department, mm -hmm. and a stage crew, and a costume department, and all those things to make Beyonce. And so that's what the lesson was. And so to me, it's really important that you know children learn in so many different ways, mm -hmm. and they can be inspired and learn about the arts and about you know it's just opening up their mind to learning. Um, through a field trip. And so education in South Carolina is crazy important. So I'm very proud of our education department. I'm proud that we have the caliber of dance company that we have. Tell us, and you know, we can't leave without, what's this? Tell so us about this. This is, um, I fell in love with Kirkland Smith, and she's an assemblage artist. Mm -hmm. And I had seen some of her work around town. She did the mayor and some things. And then what I loved about it was her creativity, and I just couldn't understand how she did it. And she also, it's all recycled, which I love. I'm a big recycled person. And so she made me save recyclable plastics and stuff for two years. And then this is how she paints. And she's really, really proud of this one. And it's, it's leaving. It's going to another exhibit. It's going to a museum later on this month in November. She says it's her best one. I, I'm very flattered that she says that. But um, I, I just love her work. And then yeah. she does this through... You know, she glues plastics and yeah. And so I, I had the windows tinted in here because I don't want it to fade. Yeah. And um, I think you're supposed to clean it with like a hair dryer. Oh wow. Then you blow the dust or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, so she did this and um, she was real nervous about it. And she had a, a big um, o opening of it. And uh huh. It was That's at, awesome. Yeah. At, um, she did storm a great waters job. at her studios, but yeah. I adore her and her Kirkland husband. Kirkland Smith. Yeah. yeah. James Smith, her husband. Mm -hmm. And so all these things, you can see point shoes, and that's my belt buckle, and <laughs> what I stuff my shoes with, and nutcrackers. And, that's awesome. Yeah, an old watch, and a key ring, and, you know, old that's great. forks, and yeah, and it makes, it makes <laughs> art quite, crazy. Quite a, a, a right? conversation piece. Yeah. What is something about sobriety that you thought, um, before you got into it, that turned out to be wrong? Like, I, I, you know, I didn't think that I, I would ever have fun without it. What's something like oh, that? Oh, that's that, interesting. Yeah. So, <clears throat> well, I was very fearful at first about being funny. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'm not going to be funny. I'm not going to have a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And I also was worried about intimacy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I thought, oh, you know. <laughs> How am I going to, yeah. you know, and sometimes it is challenging because people lose their inhibitions. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, maybe you're not supposed to be with that person. Right. And that um, you're being sober, you're more particular mm -hmm. and you're choosing probably better people. Exactly. And you remember the intimacy. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's important. Yeah. And so um, I think also what I'm surprised about is how, and I didn't even know this, but I would exaggerate. You know, I don't mm -hmm. want to say... You know, there's a big thing with being an active addiction that you lie all the time and that uh -huh. you're lying about uh -huh. how much you drink or you're lying. Uh -huh. And I would, 
I can admit that I would exaggerate the story. Uh -huh. You know, I'd embellish it and make it right. even funnier. Embellish, or grander, such a nicer word. <laughs> yeah. So I remember we were on tour in Germany, and I was writing postcards, and they're like, "William, are we on the same tour as you are?" Yeah. <laughs> they said, "Well, I said, well, everything I wrote is true. You know, we just left Paris, and we're on our way to the south of France, and um, we were sold out, and you know, I'd yeah. write all this back to the same." She said. William, we're stuck in Germany at a laundromat. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I said, well, I'm not going to write that part. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I would embellish or I would just highlight the glamorous parts. Uh-huh, so, exactly. But I think that's, you know, being honest and rigorously honest is a great gift, I think, from the program. Uh-huh. William, thank you so much. This has been great. Well, and one more thing before we go. Um, Talk about Nutcracker. Nutcracker is coming to town. Yes. And you it's will be... Coming up, it's coming up at the Coda Center. We're in lots of cities. We're in, uh, we're in Sumter, and we're in Florence, and we're going to Savannah. And then we open in Columbia um, the dates. So it's the 16th and 17th and the weekend before that. So the 9th and 10th, I think, and at, at the Coda Center. And what's exciting about this year's Nutcracker is we have brand new sets and scenery because of a big grant from the Arts Commission and from Pat and Garland McCorder. Columbia City Ballets, or the South Carolina Ballets production of Nutcracker, is the largest South Carolina-produced performing arts event in our state. And wow. so having new sets after 36 years is a big, big gift to our community. Yeah. And I'm really excited that we get to unveil those. Yeah. And how many kids are there? Well, there's 150 in, in, in Sumter. There's 70 in Savannah. There is 70 in Florence, and there's 90 local children in the Columbia production. Wow. <laughs> so it's a lot. Yeah. The, they augment, they're in children-specific roles, and they augment the production because a lot about Nutcracker is about children. Uh -huh. But, of course, they, um, they join the professional dancers that are from all over the country yeah. and that are all under contract. I'm proud of, we're the largest employer of artists in the state of South Carolina. That's great. That's great. So I'm really proud of that, too. Well, thank you so much. No, thank John, you. thank you for all you do. This is a great That's program. Great. And well, thank you. Appreciate it. And listen, thanks for joining us. Our table is ready for you. And uh, please like, share, and subscribe wherever you're listening to this or watching this or whatever you're doing with this. Uh, it'll help get the word out. Thanks again, William. No, my pleasure. It's all how we deal with what we're dealt. Love's only real because it's felt.